Yesterday's magazine from the Independent on Sunday, on the front cover, it has a beautiful picture of autumn leaves and says, the remarkable true story behind autumn's greatest show of colour. Now, it's actually an article about the Western Birth Arboretum and how it was saved and is not the true story of the coloured leaves of autumn. That's what I'm going to tell you tonight. This presentation was put together yesterday. Uh, it is an extemporised talk. Uh, you will be surprised and delighted by some of the pictures that come up, and you will be no more surprised than I will be. And with any luck, I shall be able to unravel this story for you by the time that we're due to finish in an hour from now. We all are aware of the joys of autumn. Wonderful music from Pink Floyd, put to a sequence of still images on the Dixon's movie site on YouTube. A wonderful evocation of a beautiful season, perhaps the most beautiful season of all. It is a fact that everybody notices autumn. This cartoonist uses it in order to illustrate the fact that the seasons seem to come around much more suddenly with every year that passes. And indeed, in less um, lyrical form, here is poor Garfield being submerged through his torpitude by a cascade of autumn leaves. And yet, why do plants drop their leaves? What is the reason behind it? The colour of autumn leaves is absolutely unsurpassed, particularly in places like North America, where they have much harder frosts than we do. And the aces emblazon the countryside with wonderful, lyrical colours. It really is the most memorable sight. And if we look at Michael Brown's collage of still pictures, a year in the life of an oak tree, you can see how the fecund verdancy of a tree in its full leaf is transformed almost in an instant into the bare branches of winter. 
And I do like this, also from YouTube. This is a beautiful way of encapsulating a single year in just 40 seconds. By the way, do notice that these trees, the branches up here, go up in the autumn as the leaves fall off and relieve them of their weight. That's a marvellous sequence. It reminds people of my age of what they used to show on television back in the 50s. <laughs> the train ride from Victoria Station to Brighton speeded up to last exactly 60 seconds. I see some some equally grey heads in the audience nodding in agreement with that. And yet the mystery of autumn has appealed to everybody, even to Schultz. Why don't trees have leaves in the winter? asks little Linus. And he retorts when he's told it's a stupid question, even stupid questions have answers. That, in a way, may be my single greatest motivation in science. What are the answers to the stupidest of questions? So why do plants drop their leaves? We'll turn to a current biology book and see what the explanation is there. Um, this says, and almost everybody else says the same kind of thing, that it is um, an adaptation to winter drought. That evergreen trees may have specially small or needle-like leaves that cut down transpiration losses so drought is not so important. Or that other adaptations to drought include leaves with thick, waxy cuticles. That is the universal view. That's what we were all taught in school. Let's go to another current biology book. Why do leaves fall? It is an important survival mechanism when temperatures and or light intensity are too low for efficient photosynthesis. And indeed, the phenomenon of abscission, of the dropping of leaves, was the subject of an entire book by Fred Adicott, a professor at Davis in California some years ago, published in 1982. Uh, this is a wonderful book and uh, a revealing book. And he lists all of the then known reasons that were put forward for the abscission of leaves by deciduous trees. The removal of senescent leaves, of injured or infected leaves, the removal of excess foliage from stressed plants, the defoliation of deciduous trees, the recycling of mineral constituents, although it has to be said that plants are hardly likely to evolve leaf fall purely in order to recycle mineral constituents. Protection by development of leaf scars and spinescent petioles. Spinescent petioles are, the, are the, the bases of leaves, which are things like um, Trachycarpus palm trees. It's the leaf bases that project from the central stem and actually give the, the sense of solidity to the trunk. And also protect it, of course, by sticking out and preventing any damage to the main trunk. Leaf fall is involved in vegetative propagation. That's true. There are some plants, like the begonias, which shed leaves as an agent of propagation. Uh, there's an asplenium, a fern, which also does the same kind of thing. Little bulbils fall from the leaves, from the pinules as they're shed. The facilitation of pollination and seed dispersal by animal agents. Or the inhibition of seed germination of competitors, allelopathy. And this also is important for trees. When a tree is surrounded by a mat of dead leaves, it may well be that some of the the, the lysing constituents from the leaves, the, the leachate that, that, that moves out into the soil, serves to inhibit the growth of seeds beneath the tree and therefore serve to stop the tree from being uh, crowded. Though that can't be a reason why the tree evolved leaf fall in the first place. And indeed that remains a perpetual mystery. And so let us look at how so many of these essential rules actually don't hold up in practice. The first, that leaves will be damaged. Well, indeed, that's the case. Here is a plant 
uh, smitten with a sudden frost before the leaves have been shed, and most of the leaves have been damaged by the fall of temperature. If we look at the common honeysuckle, then it will drop its leaves in the autumn. And we all know from school, don't we, that the reason the leaves were dropped is to prevent them from being damaged during the frosty nights of winter. But other species, like Caprifolium, Lanicera is in the family of the Caprifoliaceae, so this is, as it were, a species that typifies the family. Uh, this one is listed as an evergreen Lanicera. The leaves are much the same. The plants look very similar. One of them feels compelled to drop its leaves, and the other one doesn't. And there are many genera in which ostensibly similar plants are either evergreen or deciduous. So it is not necessary for plants to drop their leaves in order to survive the winter. That is not the case. Another great argument is for competition, for nutrient or for water. And here is a Swiss cheese plant, Monstera deliciosa, growing in the middle of tropical rainforest. Very little light, very little nutriment, massive competition, enormous competitive pressures for water and nutriment. And yet the plant grows perfectly contentedly and it sheds leaves as it grows. The older leaves absize and fall to the floor of the forest. Find exactly the same plant growing at the edge of the rainforest and although the leaves are slightly uh, more uh, lustrous and slightly broader, they're not so etiolated because there is more light, but they have negligible competition for nutriment, far less competition for water, no competition at all for light. But they still go in much the same way, and they still absize leaves, just as the deep forest plant did. So this notion that leaves are shed because plants are in competition for low levels or decreasing levels of water or for nutriment doesn't hold up. The lack of water is another clear indication. And if you look at drought plants like these in the Sahara, then yes, as the leaves grow older, they absize and are lost. And you can easily think to yourself, well, if the leaves were maintained in a young and verdant and actively transpiring form, then it is quite likely that these transpiring leaves would cause the plant critically to lose water and to suffer in consequence. And so therefore, the leaves are adapted in order to maintain their levels of internal water, and those that aren't needed are dropped. But come with me into the Amazon, and there you will find the largest water lily that exists, and these plants also absize their leaves. They are sitting in water. There is no shortage of light. There is no competition for water. There is no lack of soluble nutrients. And yet these plants grow and absize their leaves. And if we look at any other water plant, Keratophyllum, here's an example. And if you look at the plant and you see that as it grows, the plants turn uh, yellow, the leaves become paler, and eventually they end up brown and they are absized. Just as though this is a plant not in tropical watercourses, but a plant growing on the land up in Europe when winter is round the corner. Elodea canadensis, the common uh, pondweed that so many aquarists uh, grow, believing that it oxygenates the water. Well, when the sun is shining, it does. Otherwise, it consumes oxygen like any other living thing. But be that as it may, that's probably another lecture. But if you look at the, uh, the way that the plant grows, as it moves along, leaves change colour, become brown, and are absized. So even when you have a plant living in water, where it's surrounded by everything it needs, the plants still feel an overwhelming urge, a compulsion in some way to shed their leaves. 